Imagine this stage is a sea of content. All of the content that's available to us, all the images, all the pictures, all the news stories that are available to us. And this space, this space right in front of me, this is what I can see. This is what has been chosen to me. Everything else, everything out in the sea that I can't see, that is filtered. That is the filtered content. In August of 2014, there were riots. There were riots in Ferguson, Missouri. People were wounded. Cars were smashed. Cars were torched. People were wounded. A city was wounded. This was an important social event. But in the same month, in the sa at the same time, in August of 2014, I opened up my Facebook news feed and I saw this. I saw pictures and videos of people pouring buckets of ice water over their heads. They weren't doing it for fun, they were doing it for charity. They were doing it to support the ALS Association, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. And these were both important events. But I asked myself, why didn't I see this? Why didn't I see pictures or videos or information about these riots, which were, uh, directly affected me as a citizen of the United States as, and as a human? I, I, after learning that I didn't see these, I was confused, I was frustrated. Why didn't I see this content? Why wasn't, it, why wasn't I aware? Well, let's take a step back. In the mid-1900s, newsprint media was at its prime. Editors like this sat in newsrooms and picked the most relevant content for their readers. They knew a bit of information, they knew their geographical location, maybe their age, if that. But ultimately, they were guessing. They were guessing on what people valued, what people would find interesting. And they had to make choices. They had to choose what people would find meaningful. They had to choose what people saw, and indirectly, they also chose what people didn't see. They were the gatekeepers. They filtered the content. Nowadays, as more and more people go online, there's more and more content. More and more content is created every single day. This infographic displays all of the content that is created every minute of every day. And there's no possible way that any one of us, any individual, could possibly absorb all of this information. So we have to make choices. People or machines have to make choices of what we see. They have to be able to determine what is meaningful to us. And that's where Facebook steps in. That's what they tried to do. They tried to pick all of the information out that is available to us and pick the most meaningful information to us. Now, they do this in a variety of different ways, but ultimately, all of the content you see today is personalized to us. It's tailored for us. It's filtered for us. Google tailors their search results. Facebook tailors their posts. Amazon tailors their advertisements. Netflix tailors their recommendations. And OkCupid tailors relationships. They try and match people based off of the information you've provided. So chances are, if Google, if, you, if you've searched on Google and you have a Google account, your search results are personalized to you. It lo looks at all the past searches that you've done and it, it tries to assess what you value, what's important to you, and what's relevant. So let's say you search uh, for universities in Maine. And then 10 minutes later, you search for simply universities. It's more likely to show you universities that are geographically centered in Maine. And it uses all of the data that, you, that it, it collected previously about how you've interacted with the sources to provide you with sources that it thinks you might find valuable today. Facebook does the same thing. It looks at what your friends like, what your friends share, what your family shares. It looks to the people that you care about to find out what you care about, what's meaningful to you. And like I showed you on this, this previous slide, they try to find the most meaningful information for you. Amazon tailors their advertisements. If you've ever searched for a product on Amazon, uh, maybe a soccer ball, a new water bottle, anything, you might see advertisements tailored to you almost immediately. 15, 10, 15 minutes later, you've, you will see advertisements 
for those. Netflix tailors their movie recommendations. You may think that the Netflix recommendations, the five-star ratings that you see online, are a cumulative average of all the users who have rated that movie. But it's not. It's what Netflix thinks you would rate the movie out of five stars. And they do this by looking at how you rated past movies, how your friends have rated movies. And it's not simply a collection of ratings that people have provided. It's specifically personalized to you. It, the, these, these algorithms feed off the information that you've already provided. OkCupid okay, tries to match people in relationships, and we all know how immensely complicated human relationships are. And the only thing OkCupid okay, has to go off is what you provide it, how you interact with it. So in essence, we're only being exposed to the things we've seen in the past, the things we've interacted with, the, with in the past. It's all being personalized to us. We're being exposed to the same ideas, the same types of things that we've seen before, the things that we like. We're being exposed to the same opinions. And being around the same opinions, the same people, it makes life boring. We don't get exposed to new ideas. We can't change our opinions. We can't learn new things if we're being exposed to all of the things that we've been already been exposed to. And ultimately, <coughs> this personalization, the, the, the content that we see, affects us. It, it directly affects how we feel, how we see the world. In 2012, Facebook did an experiment. They experimented with manipulating their users' moods. And they did this by showing some users content that was positive, uplifting, that people shared a lot. And it, at the same time, during the same week of testing, they showed users information and posts that were, the algorithms deemed were sadder than average. And over the course of this week, they monitored how people were interacting with the content they saw. And what they found was that there was a significant difference and how people interacted with the content they saw. The people who were shown the positive, uplifting posts posted more. They interacted more. They shared more things. They interacted with the site more. And whereas the people who were shown posts that were sadder than average interacted less. They, they went on the site less. They posted less positive information. And they, ultimately, they interacted less, if at all. It directly changed the way people felt. It changed people's moods. It changed the way they saw the world, which matters. The content we see directly affects us. And if we're constantly personalizing that content, if we're narrowing our scope, what we can see directly in front of us, to the things that we've liked in the past, the things that we've been involved in, in with the past, then we won't be exposed to new things. Now, when I opened up my news feed, I saw in 2014 of August, I saw this. I saw this content, and this is how I perceived the world. And the reason I was shown this, it, it makes sense. It's more popular, it's more likable. People commented on this, people shared it, because it was a positive thing. Whereas these riots, they're, they're complicated, they're challenging to interact with, they're serious topics. So people are less likely to express their opinions, and therefore it received less attention. But the popularity of content doesn't always correlate with its importance. Now, both of these events have something in common. They both started with an event. After the riots started after a white police officer killed a black civilian, somebody died. And in the same way, people died because of ALS. Both of these started a chain reaction of events to try and evolve humanity, change society. And they both started with an event, which led to a call for action. 
These riots were a call for action. The, the, this fundraising effort by the ALS Association was a call for action, a, 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 an effort to raise awareness. But the call of action fails if nobody's available to hear it, if I don't hear it, how do I become involved? I, I, I didn't hear about these riots on my newsfeed. And if I don't know they exist, then I, I can't be aware. I can't be aware of what's around me. And if I'm not aware, I can't take action. I can't, we can't take steps in the right direction. We can't step, take steps in the ways to change the world. Without action, there's no change. There's no evolution of society. So it really comes down to awareness, how aware we are. If we're able to view all of the content that may not be meaningful to us, but that is still important, we will be better citizens. We'll be more enabled to change the things around us. Now, there's a few parties who are responsible for this phenomenon. Both the corporations who create these algorithms are responsible, and we are responsible as consumers of this content, of this information. As we constantly consume information, the, the algorithms pick information that reflects our interests. And if we're not interested in the big topics and the things that are important, the algorithm has no reason to show us those things in the future. These corporations provide a service. And it's not a disservice, but we have to use it effectively. We have to search out the things that we really value, that are important to us, that are important to the world. Thank you.